Morning. Thank you, Jackie. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm in the forecasting business, so I thought I should establish my credentials by pointing out that on Tuesday night, I did predict that Newcastle United would beat Manchester City. <laughs> 16 to 1, what a trade. It was the wrong price. Ah, well, this joke is kind of out of date now, because after yesterday's astonishing vault fast from the Fed, this guy presumably is hitting the champagne in celebration, because they seem very much to suggest that they were done. I'm going to come back to that, because I don't think they're done, but um, it just plant that seed for now. So let's have a look at the, the big picture. Ah, growth is slowing globally, no question about that. Uh, and the root of the issue, I think, is in China rather than in the developed economies. The problem is, if you look at China's official data, and the blue line is Chinese official GDP growth, you know, <laughs> where's the slowdown? But China's data are nonsense. That's being polite. So we construct our own measure of Chinese GDP from hundreds of different indicators of activity and prices to develop um, uh, what we think is a much more realistic series. And the point is that Chinese growth strengthened pretty dramatically in 2016, early 17, when they eased quite a lot. Uh, that, um, that sort of artificial boost to growth is now uh, substantially fading away. We think growth is now well below the officially posted numbers uh, and is likely to slow quite a lot further. <coughs> quite a lot further. Some of this is structural. The enormous growth rates that China achieved in previous decades aren't sustainable. You know, the big, the big gains from moving hundreds of millions of people from the farm to the factory uh, are over. That's a one-shot deal. It took a long time. Uh, and uh, they're now transitioning into a, a different sort of higher added value manufacturing economy and a services economy. Got a long way to go, but the point is that you can't sustain 10% GDP growth with that sort of economy. Right now, though, the problem is not just structural, it's uh, a cyclical event as well. Uh, and as I said, it's got some way to run. So the authorities are not dumb. They uh, are very well aware of the, of the extent of the slowdown, regardless of the numbers that they publish. It's just like a ritual, the numbers. The, um, so the response is to ease, uh, and the policy easing is now well underway. There's probably more to come. So this downturn won't be endless, but we're not at the bottom yet. We might not be very far from the bottom in terms of perceptions, because everyone is now very much focused on this China story, uh, including the Fed yesterday. Uh, but the fact is that um, it's been quite sharp and, and quite dramatic. And if we look at it from the context of the developed economies, as well as China, there it is. It's pretty obvious. These are manufacturing indicators for China, the US, the UK, and the Eurozone. You can see a nice, strong upswing from 2016 onwards. Um, peaking late last year, uh, sorry, peaking in, in late 17, and then uh, slowdowns of varying proportions uh, in 2018. Um, the, the Chinese numbers are really quite alarming, uh, and I think that they probably mean there's further downside movements to come in the other developed economies. It will get better. So uh, we forecast China's economy from a bunch of variables, but probably the single most important one is, is the rate of growth of the money supply, which is the blue line, M1, narrow money supply. Again, you can see the big upswing in 2016 and that sustained downward trend over the last year and a half. Um, you can also see that we reckon it will bottom out in the middle of this year and start to pick up. So it's not, it's not endless. If anything, I think there's a reasonable chance that they overdo the stimulus and end up with growth running away quite aggressively to the upside by the end of this year. But looking for a turning point around, around the middle of the year. But you know, in the meantime, it's going to get worse in developed economies before it gets better. I'm just talking about manufacturing here. Um, so China's PMI, the blue line, and the US headline ISM manufacturing index, the black line, I and mean, it's pretty clear where the, where the risk is. So we, we have not yet uh, hit bottom. Uh, the ISM is a pretty good indicator of actual U.S. manufacturing output, which, surprised to the upside, the latest point for, for December was very strong, but there was a few one-off factors in there, uh, and the outlook is clearly deteriorating. wouldn't surprise me in the least if U.S. manufacturing was in recession by the late spring. But that's not necessarily the end of the world. Um, the U.S. manufacturing sector was in recession in 2015-16, while the rest of the economy sailed on more or less regardless. The problem is that markets tend to focus disproportionately on manufacturing. Uh, and when I say disproportionate, you know, it's only 8.5% of payrolls in the US and about 12% of GDP. So 
88% of the US economy is not manufacturing, but manufacturing generates a huge amount of data, very timely data, so we kind of know what's going on there in real time, and that means that markets tend to over-focus on it. The rest of the, uh, of the US economy is still doing really uh, pretty well. Here's the consumer side of things, and you'll notice the line's going in the opposite direction. So, um, these are unofficial data because, of course, thanks to the shutdown, we're, we're kind of out of retail sales data at the moment. It'll come back eventually. But um, these are the chain store sales numbers. These are remarkable, not just because of the clear uptrend over the course of the last year. Two phases, the tax cuts, the, the personal tax cuts kicked in in the spring. Uh, the money started to flow in January. People started to spend it in the spring. Then we had a bit of a leveling off, and then uh, retail gasoline prices plunged in the fourth quarter, which was just great for all these retailers because you know, holiday shopping season, the timing was just perfect. So we had this enormous surge in, in spending um, in the run-up to Christmas, uh, and that peak there on the blue line, the, the, the weekly numbers, is an all-time high. This is astonishing, 9.8% growth in nominal retail sales at chain stores. There's no internet in here, and internet is taking market share on an ongoing basis as it is here. Uh, so to achieve 9.8% you know, sales growth of physical stuff, mostly clothing, where prices are falling, uh, that's astonishing growth. Um, and um, it's not sustainable. But I think we'll probably revert back to something like where we were before the tax cuts, 4 or 5%. That's still pretty good. I mean, most British retailers of non-food items would kill for 4% uh, sales growth. Um, whereas in the US, because of the fiscal easing, which is a long-term threat, but nonetheless, in the short term, it's, it's boosting growth. Anyway, um, the consumer story, then, is completely different to the manufacturing story. It's very important to, to separate them, but, you know, this is consumer spending is 68% of GDP, manufacturing 12. The one thing that looks horrible recently is the housing market, and you've probably read about this because the press does love a, a housing market uh, slowdown story. Um, the blue line is mortgage demand, mortgage applications. The black line is new home sales. You can see the, the latest new home sales figures, again, the series has stopped temporarily because of the shutdown. But November was horrible, really horrible. But you've got to remember that the US was hit by a few unpleasant things in the fourth quarter of last year. Um, two hurricanes. Uh, Florence was earlier. Michael was, was later. And that's what I think hit, hit activity in November. And then there was the California wildfires in December and the shutdown. All sorts of horrible stuff that might make people temporarily pause. But um, mortgage rates have dropped by nearly half a point from the peak. And so mortgage demand is rising pretty strongly. The next surprise in the housing market is going to be to the upside, I think, quite strongly. So what we're going to see, I suspect, over the next few months is a real dichotomy where and people focusing on the manufacturing sector are going to be very miserable, and people focusing on the consumer sector will be, I think, pretty happy. Uh, but the, the net balance, because of the relative size of those sectors, is that actually the economy ought to do okay. There's no way the 3.5% growth rates that were achieved in the middle of last year uh, and, and in the autumn can be sustained because the tax cut kick was kind of a one-shot story. Uh, they're not going to cut taxes again. There might be some more public spending, but um, there won't be more, any more tax cuts. So that consumer, that crazy consumer strength probably won't continue. But I do think that the idea that the economy is now slowing down to a pace that means the Fed can just sit back and relax, I'm kind of nervous about that. What makes me nervous, sorry, this looks a bit like a migraine, um, what makes me nervous about this is the labor market. So the blue line is just a bunch of labor market indicators crunched together to develop a sort of a single composite how strong is labor demand number. And the black line is the actual payroll numbers, which you can see are insanely volatile. What's very striking is that in 14, 15, 16, and, and early 17, the two lines kind of moved together. Obviously, crazy things like Hurricane Harvey got in the way, but basically they moved together. And then mid-17 onwards, the actual payroll numbers have undershot relative to the hiring intentions, which probably means that companies can't find all the people that they want to hire. So we have a situation where for skilled labor, um, and actually even unskilled labor in certain sectors and, and some bits of the country, there's a real shortage of people. So um, all that means is that wage growth is beginning to pick up quite significantly. So the blue line is from the small business survey, a monthly small business survey that's been running for a very long time. Um, and it, uh, they ask companies, you know, do you have positions that you can't fill? So this jobs hard to fill number, that latest reading on the right is an all-time high, and the data go back to 1986. So this is a really super tight labor market. And you'll notice that you know, it achieved that all-time high in December despite the fourth quarter drop in stocks and all the wailing and gnashing of teeth over the manufacturing sector because most American businesses 
aren't exporting to China and aren't manufacturers. Most of them are very small service sector companies with you know, 10 or fewer employees. So labor demand is still very strong. You'll see that wage growth has been running well below the pace that you might have expected. A um, couple of reasons for that. Productivity growth has been quite slow. So real wage growth has been lagging behind. They tend to move together. But productivity growth is picking up. We've seen better CapEx numbers over the last year. Productivity growth is definitely picking up. And the other thing that's starting to emerge, I think, just over the last year, wage growth has gone from two and a half to three and a quarter. Um, I think we're starting to see people kind of realizing they've got some power and some ability to push their employers in a way that they haven't been willing to do so far in, in this cycle. Probably because of the psychological shock of the crash, which I just to emphasize was a monumental catastrophe for the American household sector. And I think it scared the pants off people for a very long time, much longer than the usual sort of recession fear tends to last. I think it made people just happy to have a job, any job. Keep your head below the parapet, don't make a fuss, don't ask for a bigger raise, you've got a job and your neighbor doesn't and he lost his house and his car and all the rest of it. It was a monumental crash, but uh, the shock is now very much beginning to fade. You can see it in the consumer surveys, people's attitudes to the labor market. You can see it in the pace of layoffs, which is at a record low. Um, and you can also see it in the number of strike days, which is starting to rise, um, quite a lot actually. So I think we're beginning to see a shift where people recognize that look, I'm scarce, I'm valuable, and if I walk out the door, my employer is gonna have the devil's own job in replacing me. So, ah, how about a bigger raise? Uh, I think this is going to continue, um, and uh, from the Fed's perspective, uh, I think they've taken their eye off the ball because this is the ball that really counts. Ultimately, the Fed's, inflation, the, the Fed's view of the inflation process is very much focused on, on wage growth. Now, 3.2, 3.3 is not scary, but um, 4 is, and 5 is impossible. Those same small businesses expect to raise prices. Um, and this is why I'm so astonished at what the Fed said yesterday, where Powell kept repeating that growth is, uh, inflation is muted. Um, yeah, it is muted today, but Jay, you, you know, you've got a monetary policy tool that works with a 12 to 18 month lag. And um, in 12 to 18 months time, if this trend continues, you're going to have an inflation problem that you haven't dealt with. So this is small businesses uh, selling prices. It tends to be very volatile, and it goes up and down when, when gas prices move up and down. So I've stripped out the impact of gas prices. <laughs> This is what's left. This is the non-gas price effect. And it's pretty clear that small businesses are expecting to raise their prices. Why? Well, possibly because they're seeking wider margins in, after all, you know, a very strong demand environment. Or uh, that they're expecting wage growth to pick up, and so they're looking to pass on the cost increases, or both. And either way, the message seems to be that uh, this muted inflation environment might not be sustainable. I'll certainly concede that occasionally the NFIB uh, gets it wrong. It was too aggressive, for example, in, in late 14, early 15. But uh, another two or three months like that, and um, things will, I think, become very interesting. The Fed watches this very closely, by the way, so I'm, again, surprised that they've gone all in, really, on this slow down, everything will be wonderful story. Uh, the fact is that Real U.S. interest rates are still very, very low, just above zero. Um, and that's important if, you, you know, if you're really buying into this idea as a Fed now, just fully invested in, that um, the labor market isn't going to tighten further and give them an inflation problem. Looking back at the history, you know, in order to, to generate a, a cyclical turn in the unemployment rate, you need real interest rates north of 2%, and we're currently at zero, and that's a heck of a big gap. Even if you adjust these numbers to take account of the fact that the Fed is now doing... QT, and shrinking its balance sheet, you still only get to real rates of two and a half, two, uh, sorry, uh, about 50 to 75 basis points. Um, so still well below that 2% uh, number that's been important in the past. So the black line is the unemployment rate, but it's inverted. So the turning points there to the downside are, are actually rising unemployment with that, the 10% peak in 2009. So we're currently at 3.9. Um, and, uh, and still likely to head further down. Payroll growth, as I showed you earlier, you know, is not as strong as companies want it to be, but it's still very strong. 200,000 a month is, is the trend. There's no way the labor force can grow 200,000 a month. So the unemployment rate probably is going to keep falling. Um, and yet the implication of the Fed statement yesterday is that it's probably going to stabilize and that wage growth probably isn't going to go nuts and that everything is fine. Um, I don't know what they're smoking over there. Anyway. Um, Here's the thing. How do, how do interest rates work? You raise rates. Well, what happens? Well, 
Usually what happens is that businesses and consumers respond to the increasing cost of debt service. Uh, except debt service costs, the black line for businesses uh, as a share of GDP, are still falling three years after the first rate hike. Uh, and that's different. So if you look back at the previous tightening cycle, 2004, 2005, when they hiked at 17 consecutive meetings, 25 basis points each time, uh, you'll see that uh, debt service costs for businesses rose in parallel, but with a two-year lag. Exactly two years after the first rate hike, debt service costs began to rise and, it, and, and continued on a parallel track. Once they got above 2%, as usual, you know, the economy uh, rolled over. Um, but now, three years after the first rate hike, debt service costs are still falling. Why? Well, probably because businesses did what the Fed wanted them to do during the period of super easing, which is to take longer debt. Take advantage of the flattening of the curve. Remember, the Fed bought shed loads of treasuries and then used Operation Twist to push them all out to the long end of the curve. So they drove down long rates very successfully um, uh, and positively encouraged businesses to take longer debt. So over the course of the, the last few years, at, at the point of issue, U.S. corporate bonds, the weighted average maturity has been 16, 17 years, whereas in the previous upswing, it was more like eight. So what this means is that the crystallization of the Fed's actions in terms of corporate debt service cost is taking much longer than usual. So there is no reason at all to expect to see some sort of serious corporate slowdown at this point. Debt service costs are not constraining them at all. Now, of course, the other way interest rates work is by scaring people. Um, and uh, the drop in the stock market in the fourth quarter has certainly dampened business confidence. And of course, the China effect has dampened manufacturing confidence substantially. But fundamentally, um, I, I'm not convinced that we're yet in a position where monetary policy is actually meaningfully uh, threatening to impose a significant slowdown. It's the same story in the consumer sector. Um, again, Fed funds is, is the blue line, and the black line is, is uh, household debt service as a share of personal income after tax. And as you can see, still falling, record low. There is no pressure on the household sector in aggregate. Um, and even though mortgage rates are off their lows, they're still very low. Um, and they're actually negative in real terms because house price inflation is higher than mortgage rates. So again, you know, where's the consumer pressure story from what the Fed has done so far? Um, I don't see it, and so I don't buy the idea that they've done enough. Financial conditions certainly tightened at the end of last year, heavily influenced by the stock market, but credit spreads widened uh, a bit as well. Um, but they've recovered substantially, and of course, if I added yesterday's stock market performance to the chart, it would have popped up substantially. Thank you, Jay. Um, the Fed put is alive and well. Uh, it actually resurrected as of yesterday. Um, so, so about half, more than half now, of that, of that tightening financial conditions uh, has reversed. Um, and uh, I think probably will ease further now as the market kind of digests the idea that the Fed has taken itself off the table formally for now really for some time. But um, I'm not convinced they're off the hook. I'm really not. So what really drives them is, is the labor market. The blue line here is, is, is the rate of growth of hourly earnings, which I showed you earlier, um, rising over the last year from 25 to 3 and a quarter. And the black line is the funds rate. Um, you know, if you sent me away to a desert island you know, with my eight choices of music and, um, and said, you know, what, what, what's going to be your luxury? My luxury would be this chart because I could take this chart with me and it would tell me what was happening to the global monetary policy no matter what, provided I could update it. So I need a Bloomberg as well. But anyway, um, I could sneak one in. Um, but the point is that, you know, they followed the rate of growth of wages pretty slavishly for a very long time. And this is because their inflation model is fundamentally driven by the rate of growth of unit labor costs, which is wages less productivity growth. They tend to assume in the short term that productivity growth will be broadly steady because it's super volatile, very unpredictable, and gets revised literally forever. Whereas the wage numbers, although they're short term volatile, the trends are very clear and the revisions are small. So, the variability in the key input to the Fed's inflation model is that black, is the blue line, is wage growth. So, um, as you can see, that uh, wage growth peaking at about four or four and a quarter, as it did in 1990, as it did in 97, as it did in 2000, as it did in 2006, puts the Fed into full-on slam on the brakes mode. Now, I think wage growth is heading up to those rates now, and the Fed effectively said yesterday that as far as they're concerned, they're probably done. And that, to me, is an astonishing position to take uh, at this point. They, um, they're really running the risk of a significant policy mistake. That's contingent, to be clear, on a China trade deal. 
Uh, and I think there will be a China trade deal because I think both the US and China very, very badly want one. They're both heavily incentivized now to do a deal because the manufacturing sectors in both economies are cratering. The US agriculture is suffering very badly, um, including in Wisconsin, which is a state that won Trump the election effectively by 70,000 votes. 8% um, of Wisconsin's farms have gone bust over the last year. You can't be re-elected with that sort of backdrop. You just can't. So um, I think there's enormous pressure uh, on, uh, on the administration to do a deal with China, and China wants a deal, no question about it. So I expect there to be some sort of a concrete deal, uh, certainly in, in outline terms, not necessarily signed uh, by the spring, which I think is a massive risk on event for markets and therefore eases financial conditions substantially all around the world uh, and puts the focus back on this. So right now, I'm very happy to accept that for the next few months, we're going to be hearing a lot about downturns and a lot about manufacturing weakness and all the rest of it. But don't take your eye off the ball. This is the ball. Meanwhile, in Europe, um, where are we? Uh, Europe, uh, European GDP growth slowed as well over the last year. Uh, people got very excited about Europe in late 17, really outperforming all expectations. Uh, and then, unfortunately, we had a real bout of straight-line extrapolation. <laughs> 2018 will be even better. Hmm, oops. Um, <laughs> this is what markets do, and economists are guilty of it as well. Because usually, you know, tomorrow looks like yesterday. That's, as, a, as a base case forecast, that's a pretty good place to start. Um, but not always. And um, we, we model uh, European GDP growth from a bunch of variables. But again, the most important one is narrow money growth. It doesn't work in the US, by the way, but it works well for China and Europe. And um, anyway, you can see that that, that, that sort of um, money supply driven model was predicting a slowdown uh, for quite a while. Um, it's probably almost run its course. And of course, expectations of European growth have really been battered down over the last few months. Italy's in recession. Um, France and Germany have weakened substantially. I think part of the story has been the, uh, the new emissions regulations in the auto sector, which, which sort of pumped the auto market up ahead of the regulations and then crushed it subsequently. And for European manufacturing, the auto business is kind of the be-all and end-all. So that's been a big part of the story. But China has been a, a big hit as well. Um, you know, Germany has made it its business to expand aggressively into China. And over the last year, Chinese, uh, German exports to China are down by about 8%. So there's been a pretty substantial hit uh, from, from both sides. And um, so growth is running now at you know, an annualized less than 1%. Manufacturing, again, like the US, manufacturing sentiment has, has cratered. Um, maybe the hard numbers are sort of overdoing the gloom now, but there's no question. Again, look at that run-up in 17. Uh, and then just imagine that, that people were expecting that blue line to keep rising, and, and so, so the disappointment gap has been really very big. Um, Brexit's not helping either. Um, German exports to the UK are clearly trending down now, kind of peaked just before the referendum. France is a slightly different story. They've been trending down for some time. They picked up a little bit uh, in, in 17, but they're leveling off again now, and the outlook for French uh, exports to, to the UK, I think, is, is deteriorating. Um, the uncertainty is obviously a serious problem. The ECB uh, is still too bullish. Their growth forecasts are, are too high. Um, Europe is going to, I think, disappoint this year. There's a horrible base effect. If you have a horrible fourth quarter, then it's really difficult to get good numbers for the, for the next whole year. So downside risk for Europe. But again, you know, not, not falling apart um, and probably not slowing down enough to stop the ECB maybe tweaking rates up a little bit at the end of the year. Nothing dramatic. But at the moment, I think more likely than not that they, they begin to tighten very gradually at the end of the year. Uh, after all, the European labor market is still tightening. The unemployment rate, of course, by you know, US standards is still uh, very high, just below 8%, but it was 12%. And um, the downward trend, I think, is still in place. And so wage growth is picking up. Again, um, you know, the numbers are not at alarming rates, but the direction of travel from a European employee perspective is moving in the, in the right way. From an employer perspective and an ECB perspective, you don't necessarily want to see a lot more of this. But with the unemployment rate still tightening, you'll probably get it. So um, if that happens and wage growth begins to pick up further, uh, unemployment rate falls further, then that sort of European core inflation gap from the last few years, where inflation has been lower than you would have expected, uh, will begin to narrow. So I still think that despite all the gloom and doom surrounding European manufacturing, which is a bigger share of GDP in Europe, especially Germany, than, than it is in the US or the UK. But nonetheless, it's not the dominant bit of the economy. 
Uh, and I think there's significant upside inflation risk, core inflation risk in Europe. Headline rates coming down everywhere because of the drop in oil prices. But the core, um, which is ultimately what policymakers have to focus on, I think the pressure is, is to the upside. Ah, meanwhile, <laughs> I'm not going to spend very long talking about Brexit. Uh, but uh, the, the fact is that the business sentiment numbers are really starting to suffer now because of the uncertainty as the deadline draws near. Um, I think this is very predictable. You know, any simple bit of game theory will tell you that when you've got a deadline in a negotiation and you've got two parties to a negotiation, especially the, who's, two parties whose own positions aren't united, then you're going to end up at the wire. It's just inevitable because both sides think that the longer they stall, the more likely it is that they'll extract concessions from the other side. So when people talked you know, in 2016 after the referendum that it'll all be done and dusted, this, this was never, ever going to happen. Never going to happen. It was always going to go to the wire. And I, I never cease to be amazed that people are surprised that here we are now, you know, eight weeks from the wire, and we haven't got a deal. Of course we haven't. Of course we haven't. We were never going to get one at this point. Uh, because within both the Labour and Conservative parties, too many people think that they've got concessions that they can extract from the leadership. So um, my take, for what it's worth, is that there will be some sort of soft Brexit, details TBA. Um, there won't be a crash out. Uh, but in the meantime, the uncertainty is really quite painful. You can see it now in the consumers' confidence and spending numbers as well. That's really not a very pretty picture. Uh, and um, you know, the hard data tend to follow the sentiment numbers quite closely. And you can see it in business investment, which is trending up very nicely after the crash. I kind of got back to the peak uh, before the crash. But since the referendum, um, you know, we've seen uh, flatlining in, 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 sterling ter in, in volume terms, but as a share of GDP, really falling quite sharply. So this is really now beginning to hurt. And it'll get worse until it gets better. We're not even getting anything from the weakness of sterling. So the blue line is global exports, uh, and the black line is UK exports. So it's kind of oscillating around the trend. What we're not doing is outperforming the global export picture, which we should be, given that sterling is weakened substantially. But what happened was that UK exporters did their usual thing, which is, hmm, sterling's down 15%. I'll put my prices up by 14 and buy a new Bentley. That's what happened. That's what always happens. And then two years later, the Bentley gets repoed. That's what happens as well. Anyway, um, so... So we're not, yeah, we've got nothing out of this. We've got nothing out of this except chaos. Ah, right. So, uh, but the labor market is tight. You know, again, a legacy of that sort of uh, pre-Brexit uh, strengthening of the economy. This is the, the Phillips curve, uh, unemployment and, um, and wage increases. As you can see there, that we're kind of starting to move to the point now where unemployment is so low that, that labor here is very scarce as well, and so wage growth is, is picking up. So uh, my view is that you know, if we get a deal by March 29th at 1059, um, then uh, actually the Bank of England will focus pretty quickly on the tightening of the labor market. And I think we'll see a couple of hikes later this year. Um, market uh, is not quite so aggressive. But again, labor, labor, labor. The Bank of England's inflation view is essentially the same as the Fed's. So let me wrap up. I'm actually on time for once. So uh, I don't think we're going to see recessions in a broad range of developed economies on the back of this substantial China slowdown. It's, uh, you know, there are some pockets of real weakness, especially in Europe. As I said, Italy is, is in recession as we speak. But what we're going to see instead is substantial manufacturing slowdowns while the rest of the economy um, it, it suffers much less badly. The trade position, it, you know, again, this will look very, very difficult until the day it stops looking difficult. Remember the renegotiation of NAFTA? You know, a week before we had the deal, uh, you know, the media was full of, oh, God, it's all falling apart. We're never going to get a deal. It's the end of the world. And then, you know, oh, we've got a deal. Um, there will be a deal. I think what happens is that um, China, the way that China, that Xi Jinping sells a deal to Chinese people is, you know, where we've agreed to, you know, to stop these forced technology transfers that annoy the Americans so much because we don't need them anymore because we've now got, got our own R&D and our own technology and, you know, we're as good as them, so we don't need to steal their stuff anymore. And Trump goes back and tells the American people they're not going to steal our stuff anymore. It's a, a clear grounds for, a, for a, a deal that both sides can present as a win. And they desperately need a win, so they'll get one. Um, and I kind of think, you know, maybe that the March 1st deadline is probably asking a bit much. Trade negotiations are very complex. But um, I think that uh, there'll be a deal by the spring. Uh, which will, at the very least, remove the threat of the tariffs going up and, at more likely, will result in the tariffs coming off. 
And if the tariffs come off, uh, I promise you, you know, we'll see a huge rally in U.S. equities, uh, very substantial easing of financial conditions. Um, the, uh, the dollar probably will weaken. You know, the, the end of the tariffs ought to, to strengthen the RMB. Uh, the dollar will weaken, but I'll leave all that stuff to, to George. Um, outside the U.S., where I think the policy tightening starts in the, in the middle of the year, um, you know, the U.K. is really the only wild card because of the, the, the binary situation with Brexit, which obviously... Yeah, I could be wrong, heaven forbid, but uh, the soft Brexit seems to me to be the only thing that can, can get through the Commons. So uh, if that happens, then I think we start to see some, some tightening. So, you know, at the moment, it looks you know, from a sort of a media market perception kind of angle, you know, I'm hearing a lot of talk about how nothing's going to happen to policy this year. And um, I'm not sure that's right. I think it's hugely important, I'm sorry for boring you to death on this, but don't just focus on manufacturing. It is not the be-all and end-all. U.S. manufacturing was in recession in 2016, and yeah, the Fed slowed down the tightening, but they still tightened. And they still tightened because of the labor market and because policy was still too loose. And to my mind, real short rates at zero are not going to be enough to stabilize the labor market in a position where it never poses an inflationary threat. And if that's right, then the Fed eventually has to sort of spin around very quickly, say, you know, all that stuff we said back in January, hmm, it's all changed now. Um, so potential for real volatility, kind of late spring, mid-year, that seems to me to when it, when it maybe all kicks off, maybe sooner if we get a China deal very quickly. But I think this idea that we can all just sit back and relax, not worry about central banks, not worry about rates, not worry about, um, about upside risk, uh, is very risky and, uh, and very dangerous. Just because the Fed says it doesn't necessarily make it true. Well, it makes it true at the time they say it because everybody reacts accordingly, but it doesn't make it true forever. So I will leave it there and um, hand over to George.